Welcome everyone and happy Friday. My name is Piper Hendricks and I'm the Executive Director of Stories Change Power and we are so glad that you're here today. Um, I will be introducing today's speaker, David Rosen, in just a moment. First, I want to share a few words about Stories Change Power and some tips to make the most of today's webinar. Stories Change Power is a nonpartisan nonprofit that provides professional development in advocacy communications, meaning communications aiming to shape laws, policies, and systems. We know that many mission-driven organizations take on big problems with huge hearts and small budgets. So we help them make the most of their time, talent, and funding in four key ways. We have small cohorts for new and emerging professionals in advocacy communications. We have cohorts for leaders who are looking to create an environment that promotes effective communications. We provide one-on-one -on -one coaching and we provide personalized organizational trainings. To reach more people than we can reach in our small by design cohorts, we have these free monthly webinars and we're so glad that you're here. These webinars are designed to create an effective and rewarding career in advocacy communications. But if that's not your field, no worries, you are welcome every single month. Next month, we're going to be grabbing the third rail and talking about depolarizing approaches to controversial topics. Follow us on LinkedIn to, to keep up with everything that we have underway. I also want to thank Rebecca Messer, who is the, the tech guru putting all of the information in the chat right now, the person behind the scenes that's making this possible. So now let's move on to today's discussion. A key pillar of Stories Change Power's work is bridging divides. And right now, there are many things that are dividing us. We see that along social, generational, racial, urban, and rural. All these divides, that, um, all recognizing our, our futures are shared, uh, are failing to recognize that our futures are shared, even if some of our opinions are not. Bridging a divide begins with understanding the other side. And in 2024, we can likely all agree that a political divide is one of the most concerning today, which is why I'm really delighted that David has joined us to talk about political psychology, meaning the way people behave and think around power and politics. In the next hour, you'll learn about how people come to hold their political beliefs, better understand what much of what's driving today's political divides, and if you're an advocacy communications practitioner, you'll better understand how to bridge divides or, at the very least, not deepen them. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce David Rosen, the founder of First Person Politics. He was born and raised in Dallas, Texas, a few hours north of my hometown, and has spent two decades in politics and public affairs with an emphasis on advocacy communications. David has served as a campaign strategist for numerous state legislative races and managed individual giving programs at the in Government Accountability Project, the nation's leading whistleblower protection organization. He currently handles communications for Public Citizen, the Clean Budget Coalition, and the Coalition for Sensible Safeguards. First Person Politics is a consultancy that showcases the practical and strategic applications of political psychology. David holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Tufts University, as well as master's degrees in political psychology and political management from the George Washington University. During David's presentation, we'll keep the chat open for constructive conversation. When you've got questions, please put those in the Q&A. There should be a, a Q&A button that you'll see down in the middle part of your screen. If not, there's three dots and you'll uh, need to select to see more and select that Q&A portion to, to type your questions in. We will do our best to reach all of your questions at the end of the presentation. And if not, we'll put our heads together and find a way to, to, to send you an answer. Four quick things before we move into the presentation. Just a reminder, as a webinar, you're off camera. So take care of you, move as much as you can, need and want, drink coffee, drink water, whatever it is that you need. There are closed captions, so use those if those are helpful to you. If you've got any tech difficulties or need to step away at any point, no worries, we're recording this and we'll share the recording with you when the presentation's done. And then the last reminder, there's a lot competing for our focus today. So give yourself the gift of time to be really fully present. And with that, we'll dive in, but we want to first start with hearing from all of you. And so we're going to put up a poll and I'd love to um, for you to take a moment. And, and there's two questions we've got here. There, this is not, this is a pop quiz and there's there's no wrong answer. There's no grade. Um, I guess I should say, David, there, there could be some wrong answers, but there's no grade. So, so take a moment and answer that first question. Where, where would you guess that political ideology comes from? 
And then our second question is where, um, where would you say your views are on the political spectrum in the United States? Everywhere from the far right, a little bit right, a little to the left or far left. And I know we've got some folks joining who may not um, identify either way or who are, are joining us internationally. So that's an option as well. Um, but if you go ahead and, and pop those, those, I see some, some answers coming in. I'm seeing a lot of all of the above um, and I'm seeing a little bit left, a few a bit right, far left, um, looking good. All right, let's go ahead and, and close. Well, we've got a few more, a few more if you want to. Um, and, and I should note also, if, if you're not able to, to answer in the poll, please feel free to use the chat. And let's go ahead and, and close that and show folks where where we landed. Looks, looks like a good mix on that first question. And a good mix of, of views as well. So wonderful. All right. Well, with that, thank you everybody for, for participating. And David, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks so much. And thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. I'm really looking forward to this. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and uh, something that I just am fascinated to talk about. Uh, like Piper said, please uh, Put your questions in the Q&A and uh, I will get to them at the end. I will stick around for as long as I need to, uh, as long as folks are still interested in talking about this to answer your questions and just uh, talk about this fascinating material that I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, so just wanted to quickly confirm that everyone can see my slideshow before I get going and then we'll get started. It's looking great, David. All right. Thank you so much. So today we're gonna to talk about the psychology behind political ideology. Uh, just a quick overview of where we're going and I'm gonna kind of breeze through this material pretty quickly because there's a lot to cover. We're gonna talk about some of the classic methods uh, for understanding what ideology is and their problems. Then we'll pivot to looking at the psychological approach, the one that I'm gonna teach you about today called the dual process model. We'll talk about parenting styles and how that influences people's worldviews. And finally, we'll end with a review of the two, what we call schematic domains uh, that structure people's worldviews and political beliefs. So let's start with the classic methods and problems, trying to understand how we measure and map ideology and uh, currently, uh, and why those may not be the, be the best methods. So generally when we're measuring ideology, and this is these are the methods that pollsters typically use, uh, to try to identify uh, what people's views are, there's usually one of three methods. So there's open-ended self-identification where a pollster may just ask you, what's your ideology? And let you fill in the blank answers. There's often self-identification from either a list or a range, sort of like the one that was in the poll that we just answered today. Um, and then there's also sometimes diagnostic issue questions where they give you a list of questions about particular policies or issues and from that, try to infer what your ideological beliefs and worldview are. What does the ideological spectrum look like? Well, there's actually several ways of mapping it. Uh, and let's kind of briefly go over what they are. The first is the one dimensional linear model, which simply places people on a spectrum from left to right with folks in the center being somewhere in the middle. There's also, uh, uh, what's a one-dimensional circular model, sometimes referred to as the horseshoe model, uh, where there's people on the left, the right, and the center, and then the further out you go in either direction to the left or to the right, you curve back around toward a kind of authoritarian back end. Then there's a number of two-dimensional models. One common one uh, puts the economic left and right on one spectrum on kind of one, one axis, and then the social issues on the other axis and sort of divides the world into broadly four quadrants. And then a, a similar mapping system emphasizes left and right and then pro-state versus anti-state and you get a similar spectrum of four quadrants uh, that we kind of drop people into. There's also another uh, methodology called, that's called cluster analysis. If you're familiar with the Pew Research Center, they put out a poll that uses this methodology every three or four years. And what they do is basically they use uh, statistics to try to figure out which respondents to their poll have the most in common with each other. They'll say people over here on one side all look kind of similar and people over here on another side look kind of similar. 
and some of the people in the middle, on the top, on the bottom, okay, they look kind of similar too, and then construct a narrative about uh, what they have in common and, and kind of what's, what's driving them. Let's go over some of the problems with these methods. So the first thing is that um, ideological labels are ambiguous. They can contain many conflicting views and positions. So just as a couple, a couple of examples, what is the liberal policy position on healthcare or education or immigration? The answer is that liberals in good standing can disagree on these things. Similarly with conservatives, what's the conservative position on trade or immigration or defense spending? Again, the answer is they disagree. So ideological labels are often, it's often actually difficult to nail anyone down on what they think using uh, those labels. In addition, labels are often incomplete and misleading. So for example, do social conservatives simply lack views on economic issues or do uh, economic liberals lack an opinion on social issues? Of course not. We all have opinions about all, all of these uh, things and sometimes have opinions about none of them. In addition, the difference between a social and an economic issue is often a bit illusory. So for example, take the issue of abortion, uh, you know, whether or not a woman is forced to carry her pregnancy to term, that has both impacts on her social reality as very and huge impacts on her economic future. Uh, and so that distinction is often a, a bit of more of an illusion than it is an actual reality. In addition to that, the difference between a moderate versus a liberal versus someone who's very liberal uh, can mean a lot of different things to different people. Uh, and then where does foreign policy fit into all of this? And in addition, what about new and emerging issues like, for example, artificial intelligence, which just uh, is something that I've done some work on and just cropped onto the scene in the last year or so. The existing methods that we have for measuring and mapping ideology don't really give us any good solutions to any of these problems. And these are all things that, by the way, that any good pollster will admit to you if you press them on it. Um, the classic methods also don't capture a certain the amount of ideological diversity that exists. It, they don't capture historical ideologies and non-Western belief systems. So thinking back to those two dimensional models, just an example, where would we place MAGA or sovereign citizens or monarchists or anarchists or the Muslim Brotherhood or any of the hundreds of nationalisms that have existed throughout uh, the last 200 years of history. There's just the existing methods of understanding ideology don't give us any answers for that. Remember, another thing that, that pollsters know, and again, they will admit to you if you press them on it, is that issue and policy questions, one of the most common ways for measuring a person's ideology, often measure partisanship. So this slide has an example of a poll that was given uh, and when they simply inserted the name of one side or the other's presidential candidate uh, into a question about whether people support universal health care, the answers completely changed and dramatically changed. In addition, sometimes people's policy positions may flip back and forth depending on partisan concerns, loyalty to a particular leader, and sometimes even just changing their minds. Uh, the recent uh, reversal that Republicans made on immigration reform uh, stands out as a particularly good example of that. In addition, there's often a divergence between attitudes and behaviors. What people say they believe and what they actually do when they're in power is not necessarily the same thing. So Republicans are the party that is normally associated with fighting debt and deficits, but if you look at the actual uh, observed policies of their administration, it turns out that Republican administrations are a lot worse on debt and deficits than Democratic ones are. So there's this divergence that, that, that the current methods of understanding ideology don't really have any way to explain or address. This is an example, this slide shows you um, four different years of cluster analysis that was done by the Pew Research Center. It's not important to pay attention to all of the details in this. I'm gonna show you on, the, on this next slide, it kind of simplifies the different groups, the different clusters that Pew identified each cycle. As you can see, it actually changes quite a bit every time they conduct one of these polls uh, with groups coming and going, evolving, but there's no real explanation for why you get from, you know, disaffected in 2011 to just bystanders in, in 2014, 
or what happens to some of these groups that disappear or that are that newly emerge they can they often these kinds of polls that use cluster analysis can give you a really good snapshot of where things stand right now but they don't have any explanatory power as far as how things got that way or where they're going next in general, the classic models, all of them, whether it's cluster analysis, a one-dimensional model, a two-dimensional model, they don't tell us anything about how or why ideologies form. They don't explain how, when, or why ideologies change, why particular ideologies gain or lose adherence, and they don't tell us anything about how to influence and persuade people. And the model that I'm gonna show you today actually does provide us with answers to all of these questions, even though I'm not gonna have time to get into how those questions are answered uh, for the psychological model that I'm even presenting. The fundamental problem that all of these models of ideology share is that they're defining people by external objects, things like issues and policies, claims, public figures, places, events, and histories. What political psychology has recognized is that ideology is actually like an internal phenomenon. And if you want to define it in a way that's coherent and predictive and offers you actual practical strategic advice, you need to define ideologies in terms of the subjects rather than objects, in terms of the actual human beings and what's going on in the inside, their mo people's motivations, their biases, their behaviors, their judgments, perceptions, and so on and so forth. And that's what we're gonna try to do today is give you a system of ideology that does exactly that. So let me just start with um, a basic uh, psychological concept introducing you to this idea of schemas. Schemas are basically unconscious networks of associations that organize our knowledge impulses and sensory input into meaningful experiences and memories. So if you've ever done one of those word association tests where somebody says, what's the first word that you think of when you hear whether X is mom or the Supreme Court or blue, you're that is that word association exercise is actually tapping into these unconscious networks of associations that form, in a, in a lot of ways, the, the very foundation of our experienced realities. Schemas are, uh, as psychologists understand them, not just political psychologists, all psychologists, they're the fundamental interpretive structures that our brains use to bring coherence to our perceptions and realities. Without schemas, our brains would be, and this is not a perfect analogy, but our brains would be a bit like a computer without an operating system. We'd have no way to organize and comprehend our own thoughts, feelings, impulses, and sensory. It would all just be a jumble. Schemas actually begin to form at birth, uh, starting with very simple notions like mom and food and me, as well as basic relationships like object permanence and, and cause and effect. And then over time, they gradually increase in complexity and abstraction and sophistication. If a schema is repeatedly validated by experience, it ultimately becomes highly resistant to change. And that's especially true if it's a schema that has deep roots in childhood. And our oldest and most entrenched schemas, some of those things I mentioned in that first bullet, they tend to be highly stable, highly motivating, and even automatic. The kinds of schemas that we're particularly interested in in this presentation and in, the, in, in, in uh, any discussion about ideology is our social schemas. These are the fundamental assumptions and expectations that we bring about the nature of the social world. In other words, what it means to be around other human beings, to be around people. As children, we internalize the, both the explicit and implicit expectations of the first set of people that we're all that we all grow up around, which is typically the parents in our family environment. And so parenting, childhood social norms, and cultural expectations all play a really crucial role in determining which schemas are going to prevail into adulthood, not just the ones that influence our politics, but all of them. And then in adulthood, these unconscious and sometimes conscious expectations then structure our perceptions of objects and people in the real world, including pu public and political ones. And so here is the basic story I'm going to be telling today about where ideology comes from. So in terms of whether it's nature or nurture, the answer is that political psychologists think it's actually about 50-50. But socialization, meaning parenting, does play a really important role. So 
various biological factors plus the way that you're raised leads to your social schemas, your expectations of the nature of the social world, and that ultimately leads to your political worldview. All right. So in thinking about how parenting influences our worldviews and expectations, there's kind of two kind of cardinal principles for understanding the different parenting styles. And one is, of course, demandingness, how, how much demands uh, the parent or parents place on the child, and then responsiveness, how responsive are they to the needs and desires and wishes uh, of the child. So we can set these up on a kind of uh, cornered axis where we have parents who are demanding uh, and, and undemanding on one axis and then responsive and unresponsive on the other axis. And you'll see in a, a minute why I aligned them with the corners of this chart rather than the, uh, than the sides. Uh, when you combine those two principles, you get what are known as the cardinal parenting styles. So a parent that is demanding and unresponsive is generally considered to be a strict parent. Uh, let me uh, move my things out of the way so I can see everything. When a parent is generally unresponsive and undemanding toward the child, they're considered a neglectful parent. When they are undemanding, but, al but also very responsive, that's generally considered an indulgent parent. And when they are both responsive and demanding at the same time, that's generally considered an, an involved parent. The, another word that you see commonly in the literature is an authoritative parent. That's not the same as authoritarian, authoritative. From those cardinal parenting styles, we derive a certain set of common effects that they have on children. And again, if you read parenting psychology literature, I'm, what I'm saying here, you'll find in all the literature, even if you just do a cursory Google search of it, strict parenting tends to produce kids who are fearful and obedient. Neglectful parenting tends to produce kids who are unempathetic and, and even a bit aggressive, who are assertive. They learn to very quickly that their parents are not going to be there to, to meet their needs. And so they learn to meet their needs on their own by acting assertively and aggressively. Indulgent parenting tends to lead to kids who are expressive and individuating, whereas involved parenting tends to produce kids who are cooperative and egalitarian. Those kids rationalize the, that experience of parenting and the childhood environment into a set of worldviews. People who, who are grown up in an environment where they assume the people around them uh, are threatening, where they learn to fear and be obedient toward authority figures tend to experience the world as a fundamentally dangerous place. In contrast, kids who grow up as expressive and individuating tend to see the world more in more safe and supportive terms. On the other axis, kids that grow up uh, with uh, authoritative, involved parents who learn to, who become cooperative and egalitarian tend to see the world in terms of abundance. Whereas on the other side, kids with neglectful parents who are unempathetic and aggressive tend to see the world in very much in the terms of scarcity, in terms of what they what they lack, and in terms of competition. And from this, we get the two primary schematic domains, one of which sees the world on kind of dangerous to safe terms on that, that sort of an axis, and the other of which sees the world in, in terms of either abundance or scarcity. Uh, these two schematic domains, we're gonna, or the, what we're gonna be spending the rest of the, the, the presentation talking about, they are known as right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation. Um, and both of these concepts are very well established in the literature. It's only really in the last uh, 25 or so years that political psychologists began to recognize that, oh, wait a minute, both of these things are present. Both of them are having an influence on people's behavior. And so they developed this dual process model uh, around that idea. So we're gonna address each of the domains one at a time. Let's start with the right-wing authoritarian domain, which spans from kind of dangerous worldview beliefs to safe worldview beliefs. Right now, in terms of the amount of research that has been done on uh, authoritarians, and this is true on the social dominance axis as well, we can kind of divide it up into three parts. Um, we can't really get much more nuanced 
than that at this point in time, but perhaps with an additional 50 or so years of research, we might be able to partition these axes into more parts than just three. But for now, we have people at the high end, in the middle, and on the low end. So one thing before we go any further talking about right-wing authoritarianism is that we need to be, be clear what it is not. So don't confuse right-wing authoritarianism with authoritarian states. Right-wing authoritarianism, or as I'll sometimes refer to it by shorthand, RWA, is a psychological or schematic domain, not a political system. Also, don't confuse author right-wing authoritarianism with authoritarian movements. Authoritarian movements can include people with both high RWA and high SDO. In addition, don't necessarily confuse it with authoritarian personalities or leaders. Individual autocratic leaders may have high right-wing authoritarianism, they may have high social dominance orientation, and in some cases they may actually have both. So right-wing authoritarianism generally measures individual preference for conformity, submission, and aggression. So conformity is generally defined along the lines of adherence to strict traditional social norms. Submission is defined generally as obedience to traditional authorities. And aggression is defined as coercion, support for coercive measures to enforce both of the first two. When we measure right-wing authoritarianism, generally we offer people an agree-disagree scale with usually five or seven points is the one that I've most commonly seen, where we offer people statements like the ones on this slide, such as uh, obedience and respect for authority are the most important virtues children should learn, or a lot of our rules concerning modesty and sexual behavior are just customs which are not necessarily any better or holier than those which other people follow. And you'll notice that some questions are written in a way that seems to favor an authoritarian worldview. Other, other of these statements are phrased in a way that favor the reverse of that. That's just a standard uh, methodological practice in science for any kind of survey. And we ask people whether to rate whether they agree or disagree with these statements on a seven point scale. One thing that we need to be clear about is that um, there have been a number of attempts over the years to identify left-wing authoritarianism as a phenomenon. Um, generally, things that try to define it as a discrete, independent, independently functioning phenomenon, uh, the studies that I've seen that have attempted to do that are not good. They have a lot of problems with them. Um, but I would argue that authoritarianism on the left actually has two potential origins. It's not a discrete thing that's coming out of a separate process. One is that it may be people with high right-wing authoritarianism or high, high social dominance orientation basically jumping into a left-wing political movement to gain power. An example of that would be Stalin. The other far more common origins of left-wing authoritarianism is when somebody has both high right-wing authoritarianism and low social dom dominance orientation combined in, a sim in the same person. And there's a lot of South American dictators that fit this profile. So let's look at each and point on the scale, high, middle, and low, and talk about the kinds of people who are, who are at each end of that point on that spectrum. So high right-wing authoritarianism, uh, authoritarians, what I've dubbed repressives, are generally raised in a strict parenting environment and have a dangerous worldview, as we've already established. Uh, these people, and there's dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of psychological studies documenting these traits. They tend to be obedient, closed-minded, fearful, dogmatic, exclusionary, rule-oriented, judgmental, simplistic, sexually prudish, and repressed. In terms of what they want, in the world, they tend to want to punish deviants, exclude outsiders, outsiders and enforce traditional values. And finally, there, I've also included something called the leadership preference. This is the type of leaders that they tend to prefer to be led by. So they tend to prefer forceful, domineering autocrats. At the middle of the right-wing authoritarian scale, we have a group of people I've dubbed respectives. These generally are people who have uh, either gotten mixed parenting, either parents that are neither, at neither end of the spectrum, or maybe they have one parent at one end of the spectrum and the other parent at another end. They tend to see the, wor the world in changing, challenging terms. They tend to be cautious, anxious, conciliatory, institutionalist, incrementalist, loyal, and wary. 
their demands, what they want to see in the world is they don't want to rock the boat. They prefer slow change and they like balance. They tend to prefer as leaders, leading them conciliators and compromisers. Then finally, at the low end of the right wing authoritarian scale, we have a group that I've dubbed expressives. Uh, these folks are, uh, are the beneficiaries of indulgent parenting. They see the world in safe, non-threatening, even supportive terms. They tend to be confident, creative, open-minded, individualistic, intelligent, liberated, unique, outspoken, and expressive. They tend to demand things like free expression, tolerance. They also tend to be early adopters of new ideas, new technologies. Uh, they prefer nonviolence and tend to have a higher need for accuracy. They tend to like, as leaders, warm and charismatic patrons. One thing to keep in mind as you look at all three of these different groups is that it's not just their political uh, worldviews and their political beliefs that are affected by these character traits. These traits uh, have impacts throughout a person's life in everything from the type of friends they have, the type of career and jobs that they seek out, uh, the type of communities that they choose to live in, and so forth. Let's move on, uh, just in the interest of time, to the social dominance spectrum. Uh, and here we have three groups uh, that I've dubbed cooperators, meritocrats, and dominators. Social dominance orientation measures individual preference for two things, anti-egalitarianism, which is greater inequality between groups, as well as intergroup domination, how much a person wants to oppress or subordinate other groups, typically less dominant. Much like the right-wing authoritarian scale, you measure it using a similar seven-point scale where you provide statements and ask people whether they agree or disagree. Statements are things like an ideal society requires some groups to be on top and others to be on bottom. No one group should dominate in society. Group equality should not be our primary goal, or we should do what we can to equalize conditions for different groups. At the high end of the social dominance scale are what I call dominators. They've typically received neglectful parenting and see the world in scarce competitive terms. In terms of their traits, they are status obsessed, manipulative, competitive, exploitative, hierarchical, unempathetic, misogynistic, hedonistic, disagreeable, and deceitful. They tend to demand greater inequality, obviously between groups. They wanna be on top, they value toughness, they believe the ends justify the means and have a winner take all mentality. And in terms of the type of leaders they prefer, they prefer corrupt figureheads who permit a high amount of social, economic and political predation. In the middle of the scale is a group I've dubbed meritocrats. Again, these folks have mixed parenting. They tend to see the world in very meritocratic terms and in terms of sufficiency. Their traits, they tend to be system justifying. They're very satisfied with the world and their position in it. They, they tend to be rationalizing, trusting, a bit bourgeois, and definitely unwoke. That doesn't necessarily mean that they harbor lots of bigotry and prejudice, but they're, they're not woke. Um, they're, in terms of their demands, they believe in working hard and playing by the rules. They trust the status quo and believe that people generally get what they deserve. They tend to like reassuring managers as leaders. And then finally, at the low end of the SDO spectrum, we have cooperators who benefit from involved parenting. They see the world in abundant and cooperative terms. In terms of their traits, they tend to be empathetic, cooperative, humanitarian, egalitarian, rational, consensus-oriented, inclusive, communitarian, and agreeable. They demand greater equality between groups and equitability and equity, fairness, they believe in win-win solutions and like teamwork. They tend to also like, as leaders, transformational visionaries. And so there we have the two different scales. And you can see how people, even though someone who is low RWA and low SDO might both potentially be uh, defined as liberals, they're coming at their liberalism from a very, very different place. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. My theory on how ideology works is what I call coalitions of the motivated. And I derived this theory not just from my work with the dual process model, but also from my day-to-day -day lived experience working in movement politics, uh, forming coalitions myself. People form alliances with their schematic compatriots and neighbors in order to advance common goals. 
the various political ideologies or isms that we talk about in the world are actually just rationalizations of the places where there's overlap and consensus between them, where they use language that's sufficiently ambiguous to accommodate people and groups with different motivations, but basically similar goals. Ideologies are always and inherently contested and always changing. There's no fixed eternal meaning of liberalism or conservatism or Marxism or any other ideology. They're always and inherently contested. Now, I wanna start, before I go into the practical applications, I wanna start with a study by a pair of political scientists named Hetherington and Weiler. In 2009, they published a book called Authoritarianism and Polarization in American Politics, which is one of the most influential political science uh, publications of the last 20 to 25 years. And in that book, they focus specifically on the authoritarian domain and how that has influenced and affected American politics over the last 50 or 60 years of history. What they argue is that in the mid 20th century, right-wing authoritarians were basically evenly or randomly distributed between the Republican Democratic parties. And that that began to change in response to uh, the events of the 1960s, things like civil rights, the sexual revolution and the Vietnam War. Then over the decades that followed, many of the top politi political issues that were dominating the national debates and discussion resonated with the authoritarian domain. And in addition to that, Republican politicians actively courted authoritarian voters with something called the Southern strategy, which hopefully you've heard of. Over this long period of 50 or so years, white authoritarians gradually fled from the Democratic Party and became Republicans. And through this process and the various issues that were dominating the landscape over those decades in the second half of the 20th century and the first you know, 10 or 20 years of this one, ideological polarization gradually began to fuel political partisan polarization. Again, this is a process that took uh, over 50 years to play out, and there were a number of key milestones along the way. Uh, those include things like the 1964 Goldwater campaign, uh, Watergate, where Republicans first originate the idea of a unitary, all-powerful executive, uh, uh, the idea of a kind of dominating, even cult-like figure that is above the law, the Reagan presidency, the 1994 Republican revolution. This was the first time in uh, 40 years that Republicans had recaptured the House of Representatives, the Bush presidency, and then of course the Tea Party, which was just emerging right around the time that, that Hetherington and Weiler published their work. Fast forward to 2016, I would argue that this process of a long authoritarian migration culminated with Trump winning the nomination, uh, the Republican nomination. And this actually reflected white authoritarians, what we, a group of voters that we now call Make America Great or MAGA, reaching a critical mass uh, within the GOP relative to other constituencies. And fast forward to 2024, just we're just now seeing signs uh, that authoritarians of color are starting to migrate into the GOP. There was a study posted by a guy named John Byrne Murdoch uh, just in the last few weeks that showed that we may be, that this realignment, this long authoritarian realignment that is so far centered on white Republican, white authoritarians is now starting to impact uh, authoritarians of color. I've argued on my Twitter account that people always forget that there's authoritarians uh, of color and that's true on both sides of the aisle. Uh, but uh, there, is, there are signs that they are starting to move away from the Democratic Party and potentially into the Republican Party. Again, we're at the very, very earliest phases of this, of this movement, and there's still a lot of unanswered questions about it, but I thought it was a really interesting uh, kind of early sign of where all of this may be going. To look at some of the kind of practical ways of using the dual process model in this theory, I wanna start with um, this example of consensus framing. Uh, there was a study um, in the, I think it was in the early, early 2010s that kind of looked into this and looked into how the term dependency in the way Republicans talked about uh, healthcare, whether it was Obamacare or universal healthcare was a word that was ambiguous. Um, they were saying things like universal health care would just make people more dependent on government. But when they actually looked at social dominators versus authoritarians, they were hearing different things when they heard this word dependency. What social dominators were hearing was that people dependent on government are losers 
The def dependency is a wasteful drain on resources that undermines our competitiveness and that dependency inefficiently rewards society's least productive members. Authoritarians, on the other hand, were hearing the exact same message, but getting something completely different out of it. What they were hearing was people were dependent on who are dependent on government are deviants. That dependency is a sign of lazy, sinful, and reckless behavior that threatens social cohesion. And that dependency immorally rewards bad behavior that should be punished. So it's two very different ways of hearing this same ambiguous idea around dependency. And that is how a lot of messaging works on either side of the aisle is that we pick ambiguous words that speak to the underlying motivations of people who have similar goals. Another example of this um, comes from the debate uh, around same-sex marriage. What the study found was that using the term marriage equality, which resonates with the social dominance domain, appeals to a much a di very different and in some ways much broader audience than the term freedom to marry, which really was only resonating with low right-wing authoritarians, people at the low end of that scale. They also found something similar in the debate over full same-sex marriage versus civil unions. They found that there was a group of people who had no, harbored no inherent bigotry or prejudice toward uh, gay and lesbian and bisexual people, but nonetheless preferred civil unions and they couldn't figure out why. Well, when they probed a little bit deeper, what they found is that there was some hierarchical thinking that was going into the preference for civil unions, that it was high social dominators. They didn't mind if gay and lesbian people were getting married. They just didn't want that marriage to be put on the same equal footing as traditional heterosexual marriage. And so that was what was driving their support for civil unions, even though studies found that they showed had no prejudice or bigotry otherwise toward gays and lesbians. Another example of how tailored framing might work uh, in this context is in arguments for science. So if you're, I work with uh, in a coalition, a group called the Union Concern of Concerned Scientists, which does a lot of advocacy for science. And uh, when they talk about science with uh, low SDOs and low RWAs, they're often emphasizing the truth elements of why science matters, that it's important for learning the truth about the world. Whereas when they talk to more right-leaning audiences, but particularly those high social dominators, the argument that resonates with that audience is actually around competitiveness, that we need science to help maintain our global competitiveness uh, with countries like China and Japan, India and other, other uh, high-tech manufacturers. The, the, the arguments for the truth value in science had no, didn't work with them. It just, they, they, they didn't resonate. Whereas arguments about competitiveness did. Here's an example of how focusing on people's diverging and different motivations would lead you to talk about a particular issue differently depending on who your target audience is. So if you're on the right, you're probably, you're in a position where you're gonna be talking to audiences that may be high in social dominance orientation, but also high in right-wing authoritarianism uh, and maybe one, but not the other. And how you talk about immigration, whether you favor it or oppose it is gonna be very different depending upon who you're talking to. So just as an example, if you're in favor of immigration and talking to a high SDO audience, you're gonna to wanna to be talking about the value of immigrant labor and culture, the high costs of deportation, population growth as a way to keep wages low and how citizenship is earned. Those are all things that resonate with a high SDO audience. Whereas if you're talking about it, again, still arguing in favor with a high RWA audience, the arguments that are going to resonate with them are going to be things like emphasizing the punitive provisions in any path to citizenship, the assimilation requirements, various cultural affinities that immigration immigrant groups might have with, uh, with them and with the domestic population, as well as the religious obligation to shelter. So again, the, knowing what, what is motivating people is going to tell you a lot about how to talk to them, how to persuade them, what kinds of things are going to resonate with them. And mean anything to them 
I want to actually pause here before I go any further to see how we're doing on time. Piper, should I keep going or should we stop for questions? We do have some great questions coming in. So I think, would it be possible, let's say another three or four minutes and we'll turn to questions? Uh, sure. So as I was just saying, on the right, you're typically going to be dealing with both uh, right-wing authoritarians and social dominators, people who are high on either one or both axes. And so you need to be thinking about things like, am I dealing with somebody who's a rule follower or a rule breaker? And that's often going to tell you what what their motivate, what their underlying motivations are. Rule followers are going to be authoritarians, whereas rule breakers are going to be the social dominators. In addition, um, the if you think about one of the classic tensions in right-wing politics is between the politics of exclusion. Do we just kick people out or exclude them from benefits or in some way uh, wall them out from society, or do we let them in and exploit them? And what we've, what studies have found is that authoritarians are more interested in the politics of exclusion, whereas social dominators are more interested in the politics of exploitation. Um, another thing that was a very common discussion for liberals, particularly in the Bush era, was whether are, 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 are the people who are saying this, this crazy right wing thing, are they stupid or are they lying? Well, the answer is that it depends on whether they're authoritarian or, or social dominator. Authoritarians tend to be true believers. They really genuinely believe the, the ideas that they're, they're, that they're espousing, whereas social dominators, they always know they're lying. Uh, they, they are always going to be lying deceivers. And, and you often see that in the, the corporate world where uh, executives may be saying one thing uh, to a public audience, but behind the scenes, or you find out later, they always know what the real score is. Um, as I kind of alluded to before in the dependency framing, uh, authoritarians tend to see economics as more of a morality play, whereas social dominators tend to see it as a competition. There's some other factors here, that, but I wanna skip ahead briefly to talking about the differences on the left. Uh, again, you have the same tension between rule followers and rule breakers. It's the low social dominators, the ones who believe in, who are interested in cooperation and equality who tend to be the rule followers, whereas the more expressive individuating uh, low RWAs tend to be the rule breakers. You have those same tensions on the left, and here it manifests as a politics of recognition versus the politics of integration. Do we celebrate people's differences or do we all turn everyone into just a giant melting pot? And again, uh, the politics of recognition, uh, right, uh, low RWAs, the, those expressive types are more interested in recognition and celebrating individual differences, whereas integration is much more appealing to uh, low social dominators. Um, I'll just stop there. And uh, again, this is the dual process model. Uh, this is this is generally cons. This is one of the most widely used, if not the most widely used model of ideology within academic political psychology. And it's one that I hope that you will take some time to learn about more and embrace. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. I think folks on the call can tell why I, I just I find this incredibly fascinating and and wish, you know, if I could shout it from the rooftops for more folks to to understand. I have several questions and we've got some really great questions in, in the chat and in the Q&A. So I'd like to start with, you know, as I mentioned, Stories Change Power focuses on bridge building and on, on closing divides. And I feel like in your case, that's either incredibly obvious or incredibly difficult. What would you say to advocacy communicators who are, are aiming to bridge divides through, through advocacy? Well, this model of ideology tells you not just what people might be thinking, but why. And understanding the why is really the key to reaching people, connecting with them and persuading them. And you know, if if that if it's if your goal is to find common ground, then finding common ground uh, is, is certainly one of the things that you can achieve with this. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. We talk a lot about the the words, but I think be, 
behind those really understanding that is so important. So I'd like to start too with, um, I think Alexander had a, a great question about the name of the dual, dual process model. And he's asking, is that based on a system one, system two, Nobel Prize winning, winning dual process model, or is it something different? It is, it's actually something different. Uh, so one of the dirty little secrets of psychology is that everything that has two processes is called a dual process model. Uh, so this is generally referred to as the dual process model of ideology. System one and system two thinking is really about the kind of um, fast automatic decision processes versus the slower, more deliberative, more conscious thinking. Um, and it, it, I think that's a fascinating topic as well, but actually, no, this is something different. Got it. Thank you. And another great, great question from Alexander. Isn't John Joss system, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing that, um, Jost, John Jost system, um, justification theory, the main way that people understand ideology in political psychology? So if we had more time, I'd actually get in, get into this a bit more. Uh, but I do think that Jost's system justification theory is like a hugely important way to think about ideology. And it, I actually think in some ways, it's a useful way to understand those two groups that are in the middle of both of these schematic domains. That, um, it, and I, I, I would argue that it's not necessarily a separate process, but rather kind of the system justification theory and the, the psychological manifestations of it are kind of an emergent property that arises out of, out of being in the middle of either one or both of these schematic domains. Sounds but good. Absolutely. It's like when I when I want to think about people in the middle, system justification theory is, is the first thing I go to. Good deal. And as um, you know, there, there was a time there in a conference, folks were referencing Jonathan Haidt's theory and, and I frantically emailed and said, wait, this doesn't sound right. Are there, are there resources? And so if there are resources on that as well that we can include in, in the follow-up, um, we can we can do that. So watch for, for the email, everybody. Um, other great questions. Uh, someone says that they found an adoption study that stated there's a 40% genetic component to political ideology. Do you know, mm -hmm. is that true? Yeah, so the studies that look at um, how much genetics or contributes to political beliefs and ideology, typically find that it's somewhere in the 40 to 60% range. Um, so I typically round it out to about 50 and tell people that, is it nature or is it nurture? Well, it's, it's both, it's, it's basically 50, 50. Good deal. Another question, since RWA is based around conventionalism, couldn't it just be called a scale of how conservative a person is? Could an ex-communist country then have communism as their tradition, so have a conservative, not progressive left wing, and then have a left wing authoritarianism? That's a lot to break down. So let me just start with the first piece of it. So conservatism is generally understood both by political scientists and political psychologists to be kind of a distinct thing from authoritarianism. Um, that authoritarianism is more about uh, conformity and obedience and coercion, whereas conservatism is actually more of the like the post hoc rationalization that I talked about. Uh, that it's a set of political positions and beliefs. It's not a it's not a psychology in its own right per se. So I think they're different things. As far as this the second part of that question, that, that was a, just a lot to unpack. So I'm having okay. trouble wrapping my head around. <laughs> All right, we can we can dive in a bit more if there's resources or if, if anyone would like to, to jump in and, and mm -hmm. add another question with with clarification there. But I'll move to to James's question here, recognizing that there are nine categories when we look at the high, medium, low for both RWA and SDO. Are there estimates of the shares of Republicans and Democrats who would fit into these different categories? Um, There's sort of a yes and no. I mean, the, I don't know that there's been any direct study of the population of how many people in America, you know, if we were to do a representative poll fit into each group, there isn't anything quite like that. Um, 
But from the studies that I've seen that use this model, uh, I would say that, first of all, I would say that there's more people on the, the, the kind of high authoritarian side than there are on the high social dominant side. It, the high social dominant side is 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 is, is quite a bit rarer. Uh, that's not to say that there's not plenty of people who have that, but it, it's just it's just rarer. And I mean, from what I've been able to infer, the authoritarians, at least in the U.S., probably make up somewhere between twenty five to thirty five percent of the population, roughly. Uh, I would say that like all of these different groups are going to be persistent features of both the U.S. population and any population, though their exact numbers are going to, may fluctuate at any given moment in history um, or country. Got it. Got it. My best ability to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think these are complicated questions and, and really big. I mean, it's it's I'm mindful of the fact that we're talking about, you know, the theory and it's really, it's fascinating to understand. And then if we take this into what things look like right now and thinking about the, the divisions and thinking about how, you know, we've got you know misinformation, disinformation, you know, in, on a, a big scale. And then looking also at the individual level, you hear about families who have people who no longer speak to each other because of, of political divides and really, you know, discouraging reality. And, and I'm curious amidst all of this, what, what gives you hope? Well, I think that this, model is really the first one to my mind that gives us like a real workable model of, of what people think and what people's worldviews are mm -hmm. in a way that works not just in the abstract and not just in studies, but actually resonates with all of our lived experiences. Um, just as a as an example of that, like I used to use this model to do a kind of neat bar trick where I would ask people <laughs> how they were raised and then infer from that what their ideology was. And it and it was it was kind of neat how reliably it worked. Um, but not just that, it resonates with what what we see of people's actual political behavior in our recent history. Uh, and and my own lived experiences. Um, and it's not the only model that I use, but just knowing that it feels like we actually have something that's pretty close to the right answer on a really big, complicated, thorny social phenomenon, something as big and complicated as ideology, gives me hope that we can all learn to get along a little better in the long run. I love it. I love it. Well, and I'm thinking too, it's a Friday, so perfect time to go and, and share a beer and have uh, a, a bar trick. And if folks haven't seen it, I'll include in the, the resources, the, the Heineken commercial mm -hmm. that was was really well well regarded for, for bridging divides. And I'm seeing some great comments in the the chat as well, including from, from Susan, one of our, our cohort participants. So great to see you here. We will take a look at those. I'm mindful of, of time um, and follow up after the webinar. One last question. This one's much easier. Where can folks learn more? Where can they find you? So um, I'm most active on Twitter. Um, I'm Follow me at, at First Person Paul is my Twitter handle. Um, in terms of further reading, uh, the two leading scholars on this model are uh, based out of the University of Auckland. Their names are John Duckett and Chris Sibley. Uh, now, unfortunately, a lot of their, their um, work is behind academic journal paywalls and is in academic journals. But if you want to read something that is not in an academic journal, you could go to that, uh, the book that I was talking about, I know it may be appearing backwards on your screen called Authoritarianism and Polarization in American Politics by Heathering and, and, and Weiler. It's a short read, it's only 200 pages. It's, it's I mean, it, it's definitely like, you probably need at least a college education to be able to follow it, but it's, it's still a fairly easy read and was one of the most influential political science works to, in the last 25 years, so well worth Wonderful. it. Wonderful. 
Good deal. Well, we will include those in, in the resources. And Alexander, thank you. We'll take a look at, at that as well and see if there's a, a free PDF. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. This is an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thank you, David, for sharing with us. We will have a, a you'll see a two-question poll that pops up when you exit the webinar. Please take 15 seconds, be a, a superstar, and, and give us your feedback. That's really helpful for us for, for future webinars. Um, follow so Stories Change Power on LinkedIn for future webinars. We've got a, a the next one coming up up is grabbing the third rail and talking about controversial topics. We've got ethical storytelling coming up, lots of, of good things in the year ahead. Um, for now, thank you again for joining. Have a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend ahead. Take care.